Hello and welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Virch, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. And today I'm super excited to have my friend and former colleague, John Grunsfeld on. Uh, Dr. John Grunsfeld is a former NASA astronaut who flew five missions on the space shuttle, including three to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. He also has a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Chicago and also served as NASA's Associate Administrator for science. So he's one of those underachievers. <laughs> John, it's uh, it's great to have you here. And you're in Boulder right now. Is that right? Yep. I'm in sunny Boulder, Colorado. Skiing yet or not yet? Uh, actually, I took my skis up. I like backcountry skiing uh, up into the mountains. Oh, wow. Uh, Sunday. And the wind had been so strong that all the snow got blown off of uh, the route that I had planned. Um, I had my daughter's dog with me and she, the dogs are only allowed on certain trails. Right. Uh, so there wasn't really enough snow. Uh, they oh, had man. Uh, wind gust recorded 110 miles an hour. Uh, yeah. My daughter was driving to the airport that day. Previous it, was, day yeah. it was insane. It was like hurricane in Boulder. Yep. A lot of trees down, power out, that kind of stuff. I saw some crazy videos. Well, we are, what I really want to talk about today is the James Webb Space Telescope and it is a really big deal. In fact, I don't, I'm sure you don't remember this, but five years ago, I had finished my last space flight and I was visiting Goddard, the NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center afterwards, um, just saying hi to people and Webb or the telescope was there, the James Webb Space Telescope was there. So I got a chance to see it and it was so cool. It's, it's amazing. It's just incredible. And it was so complicated. I called you afterwards because you were the associate administrator. I remember I, that. And I was like, uh, John, have you seen this thing? It's kind of complicated. <laughs> yes, I, you, yeah. You know, the it is very complicated. It's going to be an amazing observatory. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we speak, uh, it's been, you know, you saw how big it is, you know, all the, it's huge. the 18 big segments, you know, six and a half meters across. Uh, right now, it's been folded up uh, to fit in a five meter rocket fairing. Uh, so the huge sunshade that's the size of a tennis court you know, like origami has been folded up. Mm -hmm. The telescope itself has wings and transformed, you know, with a secondary coming down. Uh, so it's all, you know, really crunched up inside of that launch fairing. And, and if all goes well, uh, I think it's 7.20 a.m. on Friday, the 24th Eastern time, uh, it will lift off from French Guiana, heading directly for this spot, a million miles from Earth, almost a million miles from Earth, uh, where it will operate. But it, it is incredibly complex. Um, and, and you saw that at Goddard Space Flight Center. And I you know, had the privilege of sort of watching it getting put together piece by piece. Uh, and uh, I'll be a little bit nervous during the deployment still. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people a lot nervous. Yep. Um, this has been a long time in the making. So you know, NASA has a bunch of observatories. We had what's called the Great Observatories. So can you describe? you know, Hubble, where you went several times, is a visual telescope. Can you just talk about what Webb is and how it differs? Sure. Um, so you mentioned the Great Observatory Program. And the point of the Great Observatory Program, besides, you know, U.S. leadership in space science, advancing the frontier of knowledge, all those kind of things, but it was recognizing that in astronomy, the universe is presenting us with all kinds of information in different wavelengths of light. Uh, some light is, uh, you know, not very energetic. It's infrared light, and we built the Spitzer Observatory, the first, you know, great observatory in the infrared. We built Hubble to look at light that's coming to us. That's the kind of light that we see, visible light, um, you know, the colors of the rainbow, if you will, and ultraviolet light, which is light that's even bluer. Uh, that more energetic than you know violet light that uh, that we see, um, and then radio waves uh, are also light. Fortunately, we can observe those from the ground, um, uh, and then X rays, which are super energetic light. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with X rays that can sort of see through us and see bones yeah. and things like that. Uh, very very hot stars produce a lot of X rays. Our sun produces X rays. Fortunately, our atmosphere protects us from those, um, and then. So that was the Chandra Observatory. And then in gamma rays, which are even more energetic than X-rays, things that black holes and neutron stars and supernovas put out, we built the Compton Observatory. Mm -hmm. 
So that was the great observatories. Right. Um, of those, the Spitzer Observatory has gone pretty much too far away for us to communicate with. The Chandra Observatory is still operating in x-rays. And of course, we have the venerable Hubble Space Telescope, which after 31 years is still operating in space, largely uh, because uh, I went up there and, and our colleagues went up there and repaired the observatory and, and put in new instruments. So Hubble is still pretty much state of the art in terms of the science it does. But Hubble has its limits. As I said, Hubble sees in visible light uh, that we see in ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared, whereas the James Webb Space Telescope is entirely an infrared observatory. It was designed uh, to see where no Hubble has gone before <laughs> in the infrared and the you know, near infrared and the mid infrared. Uh, right. Infrared of course keeps going. Um, we do have the SOFIA Observatory, which is a telescope on a 747 mm -hmm. that can see even further out than Webb, but it's not as big as a telescope and it's still in the atmosphere. Right. Uh, so Webb is really pathfinding new ground in our ability to uh, observe the universe, our solar system, galaxies, exoplanets, and the distant universe in a wavelength and with capabilities that we've never had before. In a sense, the James Webb Space Telescope is the Hubble of the infrared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned how big the mirror, the mirrors, 18 of them, the work work is one large six and a half meter mirror over 20 feet across. And that will provide amazing imaging uh, in the infrared imaging that will be as clear uh, as the Hubble Space Telescope's images are in, in the visible. So I'm very excited about that, uh, largely because one of the things that Hubble has done for us is to show us that the universe is actually much more varied and, and rich and colorful than we ever imagined. Now, some of that uh, is you know, just because Hubble can stare and get really long time exposures. And some of it is because of the new instruments. Hmm. Uh, the cameras that we put on Hubble uh, in 2009 uh, have the same kind of resolution as human eyeballs. And so for the first time, we now can see the universe with the same kind of depth and clarity that we can see uh, with our own eyes, you know, here on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. The James Webb will do that for the infrared. Right. Uh, and what that's going to look like, you know, we don't really know. I'm sure it's going to be just as amazing. The infrared. Um, so a couple, there's so many things that, to unpack there. The mirror size is really the the gold standard for telescopes, right? That's the size matters. And the, the bigger the mirror, the farther the, the farther away you can see, right? The more faint signals you can see with a bigger mirror. That's exactly right. So many of the things that we want to study with the James Webb Space Telescope are really, really dim. Right. Um, and so for instance, we want to look back to the very earliest stars and galaxies in the universe. Right. Um, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Right. Remarkably, the Hubble, by staring in one place for a really, really long time, has been able to see some of the earliest galaxies that are, uh, you know, somewhere around, you know, 500 million years old. They're weird looking too, right? They're not like normal, pretty right. Andromeda galaxy. They're kind of weird shapes. The, well, they, yeah. they look like they're weird shapes. Um, they yeah. haven't formed into spirals or big elliptical right. galaxies yet. Right. And, and, and we haven't been able to see very many of these. Right. And Hubble's resolution is, is really at its limits when we're trying to observe these. So they're, they're a little bit fuzzy still. Um, Why does infrared let us see so far away, which is also back in time? They're kind of the same thing, right? Yep. Um, so the universe uh, was formed we think about 13.8 billion years ago. Earth and years at our current Earth, inertial right, reference years, frame. Yeah. Right, right, right. And uh, ever since it's been expanding. Right. And uh, the, the universe initially started as a soup of, you know, exotic fundamental particles, all, you know, very hot uh, and cooled down very rapidly. Um, and at some point, uh, it was, you know, cool enough that electrons were able to bind around protons and form hydrogen mm -hmm. um, and 
it was hot enough that some of those formed into helium. And so we had this, uni this universe that was uh, basically just hot, hot gas. Um, and eventually it started, some of the gas had, you know, one place was a little more dense than another. Right. And that density, dense region started collapsing. Uh, and at some point the first stars were formed. Right. And we don't know exactly when that was. 50 million years after the, the start of the universe, the so-called Big Bang, maybe 100 million years. And we don't know, have any idea what those stars looked like. Were they right. huge, massive stars? Were they little stars? If they were huge, massive stars, did they you know, immediately explode into, well, within a million years, a few million years form uh, supernova explosions and then collapse into black holes? So what the James Webb wants to do is to look back into that early time. Now, if you have a, a very massive hot star, uh, as you know, some of these early stars very likely were, they would produce lots of ultraviolet and visible light, just like our sun. When that light was emitted uh, in the ultraviolet, you know, it would have to travel through the universe for 13 point something billion years before getting to the James Webb Space Telescope. Right. Now, in the meantime, you know, the universe has been expanding. And so if you take that wavelength of light and you stretch it out along with the rest of the universe, even though it was emitted as an ultraviolet light, now it would be in the infrared mm -hmm. just because the expansion of space and time. And that's called a Doppler shift, right? So it's, it's the uh, cosmic redshift, right? Right. Which is a type of Doppler shift. Exactly. And, and, and I've heard it. So if you hear a, a train or a car, the frequency changes when it's coming towards you it's high frequency when it's moving away it's low frequency right for sound and the same thing happens to light right and, and mr and hubble had something to do with that right well miss mr hubble dr hubble right Edward hubble yeah uh was one of the first astronomers to notice that there was a correlation a connection between how far something is away from us and the redshift uh of the atoms and uh the right, light the emitted light. from those galaxies mm -hmm. and so atoms emit a characteristic frequency it's kind of like a tone on a piano mm -hmm. um, and th that's the same everywhere in the universe you know a hydrogen atom will emit a certain uh color of light no matter where it is and and what hubble observed is that by looking at galaxies at various distances that the further away a galaxy is, the more redshifted the light from that galaxy is right. by looking at, at these characteristic. Meaning colors. the faster it was going. So the and, farther and it's, away, it's actually faster. It it's appears to be faster. That's right. 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 Uh, and so he discovered that the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, by turning the expansion movie backwards, that right. infers that the universe had a start at some point. Right, right, right. So and, that was his the, big discovery. And that's more red, which is why you need a telescope that looks in the red infrared frequencies to see things that are really far away and therefore really old at the beginning of the almost not the beginning, but close to the beginning. Right. And this is all because light travels at a finite speed, you know, the mm -hmm. so speed of light. Now, the other thing to know uh, is that, you know, we think of, uh, you know, objects that glow that the amount of light you get from a light bulb, say, goes down as one over the distance squared. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if something's really far away, it's also really dim. And so that's why you need a really big telescope uh, to right. see it. Uh, right. it's, it's estimated that photons, you know, individual particles of light that we want to observe of these very early galaxies will, will only detect those at a rate of about one per second. Oh, wow. Even though this mirror is 20 feet oh across. God. So it's going to and take it's... a really long time exposure to right. see these baby galaxies. Hubble ob has observed toddler galaxies, if you will. <laughs> and, and we want to know, you know, what is a baby star galaxy? Right. You know, the first stars that emerged in the universe, what do they look like? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, but you can also, so you can look back in time because the infrared, you can look at really faint things because of the size but infrared also lets you do look at other things besides ancient galaxies right there's other yep. 
Yeah. I think the, the driving case for the size and the capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope was really to look back in time at these very first stars and galaxies. Right. Um, when James Webb was started, which was really about 1989, 1990, right about the time wow. Hubble was launched, uh, that's when the scientists said, hey, this is what we think we need. Right. Because uh, Hubble was already built. Right. Uh, and so, you know, it's like human nature to say, okay, great, we've built this, hasn't right. launched yet, but what's next? Right. What do we need to start working on now? Right. And they, they said, hey, it's going to be an infrared telescope. At that time, uh, we didn't know about exoplanets. Right. Now, you know, I, I used to sit as a kid on the grass looking up at the sky uh, outside of Chicago at all the stars and wondering, you know, whether there were planets around those stars, whether there were people on those planets. Right. So from a, a you know, intuitive sense, you know, you'd think, well, we have our solar system around a star. There's all these other stars. There must be solar systems around them. Right. But scientifically, we didn't know. So when they thought of James Webb, well, when they thought of a big infrared telescope, they weren't thinking, oh, let's be, a, let's look at exoplanets because we didn't know about them. We didn't know how frequent stars have solar systems. We didn't know how many planets would be around a star. Well, since then, we've had ground-based observatories, the Kepler Space Telescope, and now the TESS uh, Telescope, the Transient Exoplanet Survey Satellite, right. that have basically determined that you know, when you look up at the night sky, virtually every star has a solar system around it. Right. Um, and so what's incredible is if you were to build a telescope to go and look at those solar systems um, and specifically solar systems that are aligned in our field of view such that the planets go between us and the star, we call that a transiting planet. Right, right. If you were to design a telescope to try and understand those planets, and look at the planetary atmospheres around those planets, you'd build the James Webb Space Telescope. Wow. What's uh, an exoplanet, by the way, John? So an exoplanet is a planet around another star besides our sun. Okay. So planets around our solar system are planets. Planets around other stars are exoplanets. Outside. They're not, they're not endoplanets or anything. They're just, there's planets and there's exoplanets. Okay. I suppose endoplanets would be, you know, moons, like our our moon would be a, ah. maybe not. I don't know. About <laughs> okay. That. But that's um, what that means. You're talking about planets around other stars. Other stars, right. And so the James Webb will be able to look at planets around nearby stars. And if they have atmospheres, it will help us understand, you know, what's that atmosphere made out of. Right. Uh, so that's a very exciting thing. Now, the so other again, thing about size matters. If right. we come back to yeah. size matters, because yeah. the size of that mirror lets you see not only faint things, but also small things. Well, you, we won't actually be able to image those. Right. Um, although the large mirrors do help you see small things. Right. Um, but it's because uh, it's looking in the infrared and there's lots of uh, molecules that have features that you can identify in the infrared that you can't do in the optical. You know, hmm. the, the visible light like Hubble is great for looking at atomic phenomena mostly you know, atoms that are changing energy states and emitting photons, things like mm -hmm. stars, right? That's really mm -hmm. what it was designed for. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the infrared, we're looking at cooler things, um, temperature wise. Now that's really- the infrared, infrared is heat is good basically, for. right? Uh, well, hot things give off infrared light. You know, right. we give off infrared light. Right. And maybe you've seen, you know, those cool cameras where you look at somebody, right? Yeah. And you can tell whether they have a cold nose or a hot nose and they're you know, eyes look cooler than their skin. And if, you know, you rub your skin, it glows. Um, so that's infrared light uh, that, that is associated with hot things. Um, and so we can tell the temperature of an object by the color, if you will, of the infrared light that they emit. Um, so you could see what, like uh, nitrogen or CO2, or, or you could see gases that could potentially be associated with life. Is that right? Well, we could see gases that are associated with a planetary atmosphere. Right. And in some cases, uh, you know, you might be able to see evidence, you know, of molecules that are associated with life. There Generally, was something in Venus, right? There was some gas in the Ven Venetian atmosphere that. Well, there's, there's a claim of a detection of uh, gas called phosphine. Right. 
um, which is a relatively rare gas. Uh, it's made on Earth by industrial processes. And there's also some somewhat exotic microbes that live in like pig poop <laughs> that, that creates phosphine. Um, and so the, the observation is uh, highly contested. There's okay. some people who say they don't see it. There's some people who say they do. Right. But, but we do see phosphine in Jupiter's atmosphere. We see phosphine in Saturn's atmosphere. You know, those are very intense, high pressure, high temperature environments. Um, so even if we see phosphine in Venus's atmosphere, because I don't think we understand Venus's atmosphere very well. You know, yeah. We've never had an atmospheric probe that's been able to study the chemistry mm -hmm. of, of Venus's atmosphere. We know that it's, you know, a hell house on the surface. Of, oh, yeah. You know, super high pressure, high temperatures, you know, lead would be liquid on the surface, right. melted. Um, you know, that there's something really weird about, about Venus's runaway greenhouse atmosphere. Um, <laughs> you talk that, about greenhouse the, gases, right? Venus the is, the yeah. clouds are sulfuric acid clouds, right? And we talk often about something called extremophiles, little right. microbes that can live in extreme environments on Earth, even at the pH of battery acid. Well, right. battery acid looks mild compared to Venus's atmosphere. Battery acid, a kilometer under the ocean, hot enough to melt lead, is Venus, right. yeah. So, I had Dr. Dr. Jim, you know, Jim Head, he was on my podcast yeah. the last couple of weeks. He's been on my podcast and we, talk, we talked about Venus. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so even if the there is phosphine, yeah. I'm not sure it's, yeah. it's a biosignature, but, okay. uh, you know, but, so there, there's a lot of things that would be suggestive uh, of life. And, you know, one would be an atmosphere that has high pr percentage of oxygen, like our atmosphere, mm -hmm. because, uh, Oxygen has to be continuously replenished right. by plants, by right. algae. Right. Uh, otherwise, it, you know, the oxygen would go into rocks, i.e. rust, right. uh, and taken out of the atmosphere. Um, methane is another thing that uh, is mostly on Earth produced by life. And uh, if you saw oxygen and methane, they kind of work against each other unless you have life continually producing it. Unless you have cows making the methane. Exactly. <laughs> Cows yeah. and and microbes. Microbes make a lot right. of methane. Right, 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 right. Um, so, the, so those things, you know, would be very suggestive. And if you saw oxygen, methane, and water vapor, you know, all those together, you know, would be really exciting. Now, it's possible. You know, scientists are really clever. You know, on computers, they can make planets that briefly, for some period of time, have a lot of oxygen and these other things. So, you know, the, the discovery of those things would be super suggestive, but not a guarantee uh, that there's life on a planet. But boy, if we saw a planet about the size of Earth uh, orbiting a star where the temperatures would allow liquid water on the surface, yeah. and we saw, you know, oxygen and methane and CO2 and a few other things, uh, we'd be super excited. Yeah, That's a lot of uh, evidence, circumstantial evidence, but that's a lot of evidence. But yep. the planet only, or the web is only going to be able to do that and tests and Kepler and these other satellites when this when the planet goes in front of the star right there's a right. star so if, when the planet does this you see it get dim and you can see the the star's light going through the atmosphere like the right you see so if you look at you see sun, this right there right right yeah and so so if we're gonna take that so it, that picture of course is zoomed in right? yeah um, if you were to look at the whole Earth you know there would just be this crescent of light of the sun going through the atmosphere. Right. right. And, and the reason why you see that reddish glow there from that sunrise or sunset is that some of the light is being absorbed by the atmosphere. Now take that picture behind you of our sun and our earth and move it out, you know, billions and billions of miles away. And that's what the James Webb is going to try and do is look at that same picture and understand the constituents of the atmosphere be, by the amount that's been absorbed. And, and the reason why we study ones where they're in line and they go around, let me find a, uh, a prop. <laughs> Your zoom okay. filter may not let you, yeah, so, it's, it's coming in and out. Yep. There you go. All right, so this is, this is a reddish star, right. a, a red dwarf or an right. M dwarf. And uh, we need a planet anyway. So when the planet goes between us and that star, some of that light will be absorbed. Mm -hmm. 
just a tiny amount. Mm -hmm. um, and we can observe it with James Webb, take a snapshot. And then when the planet's not in front of the star, we take another snapshot and we take the difference between those two big numbers, something in test pilot school they told you not to do, <laughs> is subtract two big numbers and analyze the, the little bit that's left over. Well, that right. little bit that's left over is what the, we, scientists will try and then understand what's in the atmosphere of right. that tiny little planet. So we don't actually observe the planet. We just look at the light be when it's in front of the star and when it's right. not in front of the star and take the difference. A lot of computing and, power going into yep. this. Now, the, the key characteristic of the James Webb Space Telescope is not only does it take pictures, um, but in each pixel of those pictures, it can generate a spectrum of the light. It can break it up into its component wavelengths. And that's how they will be able to understand what the constituents are. Um, and that's because each molecule in an atmosphere, each molecule period, uh, as it changes energy states, quantum mechanics, it emits a photon of a characteristic color of light. Right. And each molecule is different. So, right. So in, in the story about Venus, uh, the team that claimed the phosphine detection looked at a little blip of color. So if we have color along this axis, mm -hmm. like a rainbow, one right. particular color is the color that phosphine emits. And that, that case, it happened to be in radio waves. Um, right. But it's the same principle in infrared because it's all right. light. Right. Uh, so, so a nitrogen molecule emits one frequency, right. methane a different frequency. And so uh, we can tell what those molecules are by looking at, at that. And that's what James Webb can do is break the infrared light into those colors. So, so you mentioned, so the atmosphere I've got here in this picture, the atmosphere blocks some light, so that changes the color, but it's also refraction, right? Like lower frequency, the red kind of goes straight through, but the blue gets bent more. And that not that part of the reason why it looks different colors at different altitudes? Uh, it is, although most of what's in, I think, in that picture is due to scattering. Okay. So dust in the atmosphere and yep. pollution or whatever. Okay. Well, and just variations in the density uh, in the upper atmosphere causes scattering. Ah, okay. I always thought it was refraction. I did not know that. So you, you mentioned something that I loved, and it it's an indicator of the the profession of science and the nature of physicists. You said somebody observed phosphine, but it's highly contested. And so as a scientist, as a university professor or whatever, working scientist, um, you have things like peer review and you kind of have to, there's a lot of collaboration and the, this community of people that are well-trained kind of make decisions. Um, unlike what happens in our daily lives today, where somebody puts something on Twitter and then <laughs> everybody believes it but my point is there's something to be said for the scientific method and how that peer the peer review process um applies to a lot more than the atmosphere of venus i think <laughs> it's a lesson we could all use yeah well i, th I think that's really what attracts me to science and scientists right uh and you know was part of my inspiration well you know i was uh a star trek fan as a kid and i always right. played you know mr spock because <laughs> yeah, I, I love that science approach, right? Um, and we and we do see that in our daily lives, um, right? You know, there'll There's, be a report from a drug company that says, "Hey, I think the you know the booster, you know, increases antibodies by fifty percent with you know one dose and eighty six percent with another dose," uh, but they'll say it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, right? That means right. they haven't presented the data to a lot of different scientists to allow those scientists to look at it and see if there's consensus, right. uh, to see if it's repeatable, to see if other studies can come up with the same result. Right, so, that's, that's so a the, skill that we all need more of, I think, yep. in lots of so, things. So in the Venus example, you know, the stakes are pretty high. You know, the, the team that made that observation immediately said in this, in, you know, especially in the press reports, well, we, we can't figure out why there would be phosphine in Venus's atmosphere, mm -hmm. but we think it's, it could be life. Um, you know, I think Carl Sagan would have said, well, that's the last thing I would think of. Right. You know, that extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. Right. And that's not extraordinary evidence. Right. Um, you know, because you're not creative enough to think of why there could be phosphine. 
But the first thing is you got to say, hey, are we really sure it's phosphine? Now, the team that announced it uh, was pretty sure. But another team, because it was from a telescope, took the same data, analyzed it using a slightly different technique, and didn't see any phosphine. Hmm. And so that's why I say it's contested. Right. So, so the observatory that made it went back and looked at their data and said, oh, we found a calibration error. Oh, wow. So they re-released the data and the team analyzed it and they saw the same kind of thing, but it was weaker. Right. And so scientists would say, huh, I'm not so sure that there's phosphine. Well, but that's the beauty of science. You're right. not sure. It yep. might be, but it might not be. So right. let's let's get more data. So as long as you're up front like that, that's okay. Exactly. Um, so other teams have looked at it and, you know, with other telescopes and, you know, it's not really clear uh, that there's phosphine there. But right. even better, NASA has selected two missions to Venus. Yeah. One of which will actually descend through the atmosphere with a mass spectrometer that hopefully will have the capability, you know, once they get to the launch pad, to study what the molecules are in Venus's atmosphere right. as it goes all the way down to the surface. That's amazing. You know, and then, a, then we'll know for sure. Well, what's incredible is the Soviet Union back in the 70s and 80s actually landed several Venera probes on the surface and they worked for seconds or minutes or hours. You know, they, yeah, minutes, they worked yeah. for a little while and yep, took yep. pictures. So there's actually, it, it, it looks like a picture of a rock in black and white. But when you think about what's actually happening, it's incredible. Yep. It's incredible. Well, and, we, and, and we had the Magellan mission that had right. a, a radar, right. a synthetic aperture radar that, uh, actually, I don't know, it may have been a dish radar. But anyway, it mapped the surface so that we have these incredible images of, of the surface of Venus. Yeah, we have a pretty good clouds. map of Venus. Remember, we can't see the surface of Venus with a right. telescope from Earth. Hubble right. can't see the surface of Venus. First of all, it doesn't like to look that close to the sun, but it has right. um, because the atmosphere is so thick with these clouds, you know, right. so acid clouds and such. Um, but radar can get through. So we have images and it could be that Venus is still volcanically active. Mm -hmm. know, people have looked at the structures, people like your former guest, uh, Jim Head, right. uh, planetary scientists yeah. have looked at structures and said, those don't look like fossil volcanoes those look like live volcanoes right um, and so that's pretty exciting that is it's amazing well real quick back to web so looking a long you can't look at venus so no 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 <laughs> well i want to talk about the sun shield because that's super important but it, it can look at things really old and far away be, be near the beginning of the universe it can look at exoplanet atmospheres which is incredible Yep. But it can also look through dust. Is that right? At stellar nurseries? Right. So one of the problems with Hubble, and we have these beautiful images, the pillars yeah. of creation, for instance. Yeah. You know, the, the Eagle, Eagle Nebula. Nebula. Yeah. We're looking at clouds of gas and dust uh, that are, you know, in our galaxy, the results of the churning of stars and supernova explosions and uh, some dust left over from the formation of the galaxy. And that dust is collapsing in places. And as it collapses, it heats up and eventually gets to a high enough temperature that fusion turns on and we have a new star. Right. Now, usually the dust doesn't collapse spherically, perfectly, you know, round. Right. It's lumpy. Um, it's, it's lumpy and it's, ro right. you know, there's a little bit of, of angular momentum, a little bit of rotation. And so as it collapses, like a figure skater, uh, it speeds up. And so like a typically a hurricane, a hurricane, right? Yeah. Um, so typically as this gas and dust collapses, uh, it and fusion turns on and a baby star is born, that star is rotating, but also the gas around it is rotating um, and dust and it forms a solar system. It forms a disc mm -hmm. of dust and gas. And in that disc, particles of dust hit each other. In fact, uh, you might, what expedition was uh, Ken Bowersox and Don Petter on? Oh, like four or five, I it's think. Like, yeah, it's one of the yeah. really early, early, yeah. early ones. Yeah. And, uh, and Don had a bag of crumbs, you know, like from <laughs> goldfish or something. Uh -huh. And uh, he shook it so that he could observe particles hitting each other to see if they would stick. 
and form little mini planets on the space station. Um, <laughs> well, you know, in space, we can observe the, the dust circling around and hints of planets starting to form with Hubble, with ground-based observatories. You know, we've been able to see these disks and clumps. Um, and even in one case, a planet inside of that disk. So really remarkable. The problem is that all of that gas and dust blocks most of the light from right. the baby star. So we just right. can't see it. We have right. to infer its existence. Right. Sometimes because of material that leaks out, a jet. Right. Uh, just an accident of physics uh, and, and nature, the size of the dust grains in these clouds is about one micron. Hmm. And a wavelength of light at a micron is infrared. And so the infrared light from these baby stars can sneak through the dust, uh, whereas in visible light, like we see, it scatters off the dust and gets we can't blocked see yeah. through it. Right. So James Webb will be able to peer into these star forming regions through the gas and dust so we can see the baby stars and the baby planets being born. Will it be able to see galaxy. planets, do you think? Is the resolution good enough to actually see the planets or it'll be inferred? Uh, I think it'll be inferred Okay. in part because we'll see a disk face right. on. And if we see gaps in the disk, that's because there's a planet that formed and swept out all of the right. material there. Right. Kind of like in the rings of Saturn where there's right. a moon, you see yep. gaps. Yep. Now, so, if it's really close to us, yeah. Um, and the NICMOS instrument on Hubble has shown this, if it's really close, we'll actually see the reflected light from those planets. Wow. The, and because, so we'll see, we'll see it, you know, a little star and we'll see little spots. Right. And if we go back and observe it, you know, maybe four or five times a year, we'll see that they're orbiting. They're moving. That yep. is so cool. So we were talking earlier how when the planet passes in front of the star, it gets a little dimmer and you can see it that way, it's infer that it's there that way. But the vast majority of planets are not orbiting in pointed at Earth. They're orbiting like this and we, right. we can never see them. I don't know. I don't know what the percentage is, but probably 95 percent of planets we could never see that way or something. Well, we won't be able to study their atmospheres that way. Right. We don't have this trick of subtracting the light. Right. But but as I said, the NICMOS, the near infrared camera on Hubble, which is right. not operating right now, did observe a solar system very close to us uh, that was had giant planets like mm -hmm. Jupiter sized planets. Right. And we were able to see those. Wow. And so the James Webb will be able to do that. Even if it's like this orbiting 90 right. degrees, yep. so it's not, not pointed yep. right at Earth. And, and For those of you kind, listening and not watching. You kind of need it to be 90 degrees. Right. Like, like the cartoon picture of the solar system we all think right. of. Now, those big planets cause gravity, right? And so can you see the star wobble as the planet goes around? That It kind of it makes the star move back and forth, or can we not perceive that? Uh, the wobble is is really small, right? Uh, so we probably won't be able to see that. We usually detect that by the Doppler shift in the light, right? Uh, which is a much more sensitive uh, indicator. Um, but one thing you said uh, gives me an opportunity to get up on my soapbox for a second, <laughs> uh, which is when uh, folks say there's no gravity in space. Right. That's totally wrong. Right. Um, there's gravity everywhere. Right. Uh, in, in our universe, um, because, uh, you know, Einstein taught us this, that any place that there's matter or energy, uh, right. you'll have gravity. Um, it, in Earth orbit, uh, the way you and I have been, we're in free fall the whole time. So right. we feel like there's no gravity. But actually, because we're falling towards the Earth, we're just going fast enough to keep missing the Earth. Uh, you know, we don't feel it. And, and so there's gravity everywhere. Uh, in our universe. If you had a universe with no matter in it, uh, you know, then maybe there'd be no gravity, a very right. flat, boring universe. But, but even light makes gravity? Well, we know that mass and energy are equivalent. E the equals mc e equals squared. MC squared. Yeah. Right. So if you, there's a lot of light, there will be gravity from those. Well, if there's if there's energy, then you'll have curvature, I believe. Right. Of, of space time. Yeah. That is such a fascinating and cool thing. So the the big so I, I saw 
um, a comparison I was looking at recently of the pillars of creation. If you've never seen it, Google it. It's a really amazing, it's false color, right? There's artists at the Space Telescope Science Institute that put color with reason. But anyway, the, it's it's beautifully colored. You see these big pillars of, of interstellar dust. But the infrared picture of that same thing, there's no pillars of creation. There's just millions of stars. It's amazing how the infrared just looks right through that gas or dust or whatever it is and sees all these stars being born. So in, far in fact, away. That's uh, the camera that took that called the Wide Field Camera 3. Right. Is what Drew Feustel and I installed uh, on, well, on the whole crew. But uh, you know, we <laughs> physically did it on a spacewalk on, on the mission in 2009. On 125. On STS 125. Mm -hmm. And uh, inside of that camera is a, is a chip that's like the ones in our phones, a visible light camera, and then also an infrared camera. And the technology uh, that went into building that infrared techno infrared imager and the electronics for it came from the James Webb Space Telescope program. Oh, wow. So it, it's not as good as James Webb. It's right. sort of an early version. And it's a near-infrared uh, camera, whereas the James Webb is going to be near-infrared and mid-infrared. But that's given us a taste for the kind of science that we'll be able to do with the James Webb Space Telescope. That, that you and Drew need to go back and put a new NICMAS in. Or something. Yep. And, <laughs> and, and new gyros and a little bit of new electronics. The, the gyros are probably most important because eventually you lose control. You won't be able to point it, right? As those gyros yeah. die. As the gyros die, what it will do is limit the kind of science that you can do. So right. Hubble has little teeny gyros that track, uh, it's a, that give it the ability to go from one part in the sky to another very accurately right. Right. or to you know, track a comet across right. the sky. But the actual motions are done by bigger gyros, mm -hmm. um, kind of like the control moment gyros on the International Space Station. Right. Um, and so as long as those are working, Hubble can point in different places. Um, so if you had no gyros at all, none of the little gyros on the Hubble, you could still point and like look at one place and stare for a long period of time mm -hmm. and then move to another part of the sky. But you'd have to be really clever to find the point you're you want to look at that you want to go to yeah well it won't last forever which is why i'm excited that webb's getting up there we only have a couple minutes left john but can you talk about you mentioned there's a sun shield why do you need that can you talk about the number of things that need to go right with no john grunsfeld to go up there and fix it you know there's a lot of mechanical zero yes. fault tolerant things um and it, you mentioned it's been going on for 30 years so this is this is a long-term pro this is a career yeah. this basically. is this is a uh a nasa pyramid project yeah um you know tens of thousands of people from across <clears throat> excuse me tens of thousands of of scientists engineers technicians have gone into building the james webb space telescope from the us from canada from the europeans space agency you know it's an mm -hmm. international project right uh and it's really pushing the envelope in a lot of different areas, but uh, because it's an infrared telescope and it's looking at, at objects uh, using sort of the heat signature, you can't be near something super hot like the earth. Right. And you can't have the sun beaming into the telescope. Uh, the telescope has to cool from room temperature, you know, from the temperature in French Guiana, where it's launching on an Ariane 5 rocket to uh, something like minus, you know, 230 degrees Kelvin, uh, sorry, centigrade, <laughs> uh, 40 Kelvin. Right. So right. zero is absolute zero. We're all right. atomic motion stops. This telescope is going to operate at, you know, 40 degrees above that, which is super, super cold. That's so cold. to do that, you have to block out the sunshine. And so the, the telescope has this uh, shield, if you will, from the sun, that has five layers of very thin plastic material that has an aluminum coating. Right. And on one side of the telescope, uh, it's going to be super hot. You yeah. Know, like close to the boiling point of water. Right. And on the other side, you know, each layer will insulate a little bit of temperature on the other side, 
that it will allow the telescope to cool to 40 Kelvin. You know, so hundreds of degrees of difference across this sun shield. That's amazing. Um, and so, so that's why it has the size of a tennis court size sun shield right. to block out all the, the sunlight and as it turns out, earth light. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. From the telescope. Will then it the be between the earth and sun? Pardon? Will it be between the earth and sun? It's uh, on the line between the sun, the earth, and then the telescope. Okay. And it's that unique geometric uh, arrangement of the of the sun and the earth right as it goes around that that point in space the so-called l2 lagrange point right uh is sort of stable right over the course of a year as the earth goes around the sun uh, the telescope will get dragged around by the earth in just right. that place with just little occasional puffs of propellant um, so that's the sun shield that blocks out the sun now the spacecraft will be on the sunny side because right. it has the solar panels and all this electronics that you want to operate in a warm environment. On the other side is the telescope and the electronics for the instruments and the scientific instruments that will get super, super cold, allowing it to see these very dim, uh, warm objects. That's amazing. Yep. So th this thing is basically, it's like a big SUV. It's going to launch a million miles away. It's going to unfold a, a tennis court size heat shield. And it's going to unfold a, a mirror that's almost the size of a first down and look at the beginning of the universe. It's that's incredible. Yep. Now the deployments you talked about, yeah. um, you know, there are about 40 major deployments right. that have to, uh, to go right. So the sun shield has to unfold and then, you know, deploy all those layers are squished together right now, those five layers. And once you get to space, they have to separate. Right so that you have all those uh, appropriate layers. Um, the solar panels have to come out. Then eventually uh, the mirror has to unfold because it's all folded up right now. Right. There are 18 segments and there's two wings uh, so that it folds together. And then there's a secondary mirror. So the light from the main telescope, light hits it and gets bent towards another mirror out here right. and then into the instruments. So right. that has to unfold. And right. all the stuff is on carbon fiber, you know, high tech materials. Uh, and then once that's unfolded, then each of the mirrors has to be articulated because there's 18 mirrors and you want all of them to act as one mirror. Right. And so they have to tilt them and move them around right. a little bit. So they all focus onto the same point. And it's only after all of that, uh, that we're able then to go and observe images. When will we get first light? <clears throat> when does the images start coming in? Well, you have to wait until the mirror is unfolded right. and all of that. Right. So I, you know, I think it'll be over a month before right. you know, we get the first image. But keep in mind that if we look at a single star, we're probably going to see 18 stars. Right. We shouldn't be freaked out by that. That's actually the plan. Right. And then one by one, you know, you'll move all of those stars onto the same point. That's right. getting all the mirrors aligned right. so that they're, they act as one mirror. Um, and then we can even, ch if, if some of those are individual mirrors are out of focus, we can change the shape of the mirror with actuators oh, wow. on the back right. uh, to bring them into focus, to make the, sure that each individual mirror has the right shape. I mean, that's the remarkable thing is these mirrors were ground. They're made out of beryllium, right. coated in gold, but they were ground to shape at room temperature to a known wrong shape so that when you cool them, to this 40 Kelvin, right. and we know that, that materials expand and contract. You right. cool them and they contract, you heat them, they expand. So they had to grind it to the wrong shape so that once it's cooled and, and, mm -hmm. and shrinks, it has the correct shape. Uh, so that was one of the technologies that they had to prove. But there, are, in order to, uh, to do all these deployments, you know, there's some you know, 170 little non-explosive actuators that have to release right because it's all held together for launch with launch locks 178 or so of those things all have to release properly um, and then there's uh you know miles of cords that have to be pulled on for the sunshade to come out and uh pulleys and motors and micro switches you know extraordinarily complex um you know hundreds of single point failures just as you and i talked about you know, six years ago. That's uh, administrator Gun Grunsfeld. Have you seen this thing? Yeah, that was uh, 
it was amazing how complicated it is and what an incredible engineering effort by the contractors and the folks at Goddard and in Europe and Canada. I'm super excited. I can't wait. So this is everybody. This podcast will be early Christmas present for our listeners to talk about web. <laughs> yep. Well, the, hopefully the web will be a Christmas present for all of humanity. The all of world, the whole world. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Well, John, thank you. I know we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on board. And if you love the podcast, please give us a rating and subscribe. Uh, thanks again for coming on Down to Earth with Terry Virch, John. It's a pleasure to be on. Good to see you.